Good morning, this is Eddie Oldfield, the Chair for the Quest New Brunswick Caucus. I'm uh, pleased to welcome you to our final webinar in this uh, year's uh, project uh, funded by the New Brunswick Environmental Trust Fund and with the support of NB Power. Um, today's webinar, I'm going to be sharing with you a, a piece of work that we've been working on for a few months now with uh, the input of the Quest New Brunswick Caucus, uh, as well as Quest staff um, as we went about developing what we call a community energy planning primer for New Brunswick municipalities. And so today I will give you a taste of the uh, what's in the primer, um, what are the goals of the primer and benefits uh, of a primer for New Brunswick municipalities. I'll give you a, a quick look at the actual primer and point you to the website where we intend to uh, launch the primer uh, later today, March 31st. So welcome everybody to the Quest New Brunswick webinar series and thanks for joining us today. A little bit later I will open the lines uh, for some discussion. In the meantime, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to share them uh, using the chat box on your dashboard. Uh, so if you have any questions, comments uh, or concerns, you can certainly raise those uh, to me using the chat box. So perhaps to start, I thought I should give a little backgrounder on QUEST. Uh, what is QUEST? QUEST is an acronym. It stands for Quality Urban Energy Systems of Tomorrow, a national nonprofit organization, uh, which has also eight provincial caucuses uh, across the country, including one in New Brunswick. Uh, we also have an annual conference. The next one is taking place in Calgary in October. And it's an excellent opportunity for a variety of um, stakeholders from utilities, uh, real estate developers, uh, municipalities, uh, and others to, to come together and talk about uh, what is working well, what are some of the barriers and opportunities for advancing smart energy communities in Canada. And I'll, and I'll explain what a smart energy community is in just a moment, but if you are interested in, in digging further, you can visit our website. It's listed here at the bottom, questcanada.org. If you want to find out more about the smart energy community, uh, you go to the solution page. Uh, Quest New Brunswick uh, also has a caucus. So we have about 40 participants on the caucus uh, across uh, many sectors, including energy utilities, government, academia, private sector, and so forth. Uh, we've been working on a number of things, including a project funded by the Environmental Trust Fund and NB Power. Um, and you can find more information about the Quest New Brunswick on the national website. So coming back to smart energy communities and what that is, we typically think about smart energy communities as, in, as incorporating these three key elements. It's a community that is essentially not just dealing with energy on a project by project or case by case basis, or just simply paying the bill at the end of the month, uh, but looking at energy in a more planned fashion in, in all respects. So we look at where there are opportunities to integrate conventional energy networks, be it electricity, natural gas, or other thermal and district energy systems, and, and coordinating those better to meet and match the needs of the community. Uh, this can also include incorporating renewables onto conventional energy networks. Secondly, making smarter land use decisions. And this is because land use decisions have a long-term impact on energy usage and, and potentially energy waste. And so the types of decisions municipalities make in particular around um, subdivisions, uh, developments, uh, bylaws, um, zoning, and so forth can have an impact on energy usage in a community and energy cost in a community for a long term. And finally, the third point is a uh, smart energy community considers what local energy opportunities uh, can be harnessed, uh, including renewable sources like solar, wind, geothermal, biogas, biomass, uh, waste heat capture, uh, and so forth, and integrating those uh, to match the needs of a, of a community. As I mentioned earlier, you can go on the national website to find out more about smart energy communities in Canada and some of the um, excellent work that has that been done under Quest uh, to identify those and, and um, to elaborate on some of those in some of the research and reports that we produce. 
So as part of the project this year, uh, the Quest New Brunswick Caucus uh, had a number of deliverables, uh, one of which was these community energy planning exercises. We, we held four of them. They were tabletop exercises. We had panel presentations and discussion, and it was an excellent way to bring together a whole variety of municipalities and energy stakeholders uh, and other uh, community stakeholders uh, to look at in a very low-tech fashion uh, what are some of the energy opportunities, whether it's conservation and efficiency or waste heat capture or renewable energy production uh, in those ver various communities. And we used a tabletop map for that exercise um, and it, it facilitated the, the discussion and the sharing of highlights from the table presentations. Uh, a final report from that was also published. It's available online at the link provided. And there's a growing interest in community energy planning as a way to uh, advance communities on a number of fronts. One is uh, that communities are spending a, a tremendous amount of money on energy. And I, I don't just mean municipal corporate assets, but also community wide. So when we look at this table, what we are looking at is an assessment of what communities are spending on energy on average. So a community of less than 20,000 people uh, may be spending up upwards of $80 million on energy per year, and that includes the entire community. And of course, larger communities are spending even more. And I'll show you an example a little bit later of the City of London, uh, how it's, uh, there's a great image that they have um, showing the breakdown of energy costs in a year and how much of that actually stays in a community. And it's a very small percentage. And so this uh, is important because communities that embark on this process of community energy planning are doing it because they see a, re a way to potentially reduce energy costs, uh, keep energy dollars local uh, through through new new types of energy production and uh, uh, other sources, as well as improve efficiency and reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Another um, noble goal, I think, that many municipalities are embarking on with uh, some of the new commitments being made uh, federally and internationally uh, on carbon reduction to address climate change. But the energy costs are, are one of the key drivers at the municipal level, and that's important to note. So this is the graphic I wanted to show you of the City of London. On, uh, and it's estimated about $1.5 billion is spent on energy in this city of about 140,000. I might be wrong on that, but it's, it's, it's a larger city compared to communities in New Brunswick. And uh, it's broken down here by type of energy. And if you look closely, uh, there's a percentage of which uh, the spending stays in the city of London. So let's take electricity, for example. Uh, they're spending about $492 million on electricity in a year, uh, of which only 14% stays in the city of London. That's a lot of money that's exiting the community. And that's true of uh, pretty well everywhere in Canada, but there are some differences. In Ontario, for example, uh, the uh, there are a lot of local distribution utilities. Uh, so some of that fund, uh, some of that energy cost may be staying in the community because of a local distribution utility. Uh, the same is not true in most of New Brunswick. We have one uh, Crown Corporation, NB Power, and three municipal electric utilities. And then, of course, we also have uh, providers of natural gas uh, and so forth. So uh, the breakdown might look a little different, but nevertheless, uh, what we spend on energy tends to leave the community, and if we can find ways to conserve and to produce locally, uh, some of that energy, some of those energy dollars can remain local as well. So, uh, what we decided to do this year uh, f um, was to develop a community energy planning primer for New Brunswick municipalities, a, a, a type of guide that explains what is a community energy plan. What are some of the benefits of community energy planning? Uh, some factors to consider as you get started and how to you know, get council engaged and other stakeholders engaged. It lays out a number of steps to take in developing and implementing a plan, as well as potential actions you can include in a plan and financing options, and discusses briefly the, the planning framework and the energy fr uh, planning framework in New Brunswick. Uh, it obviously goes into quite a bit of detail. I won't be able to share all of that with you today, but I will encourage you to visit our website later today uh, to find the document, uh, which we will be launching shortly. So this is a screenshot of the cover page and the inside table of contents, uh, as it were. But I'm just going to 
I've extracted some of the key content and I'm going to share that with you today uh, to, to get you uh, familiarized with the primer. So first of all, as I mentioned, this is a primer for municipalities, understanding that they are able to uh, make key decisions around energy usage over the long term. should also be noted that uh, municipalities account for over 56% of greenhouse gas emissions uh, or have direct and indirect control over 56% of greenhouse gas emissions and roughly the same percentage with respect to energy. And so decisions it makes can have a long-term impact, not just for their own municipal corporate assets, but also community-wide. There's been some great examples here in New Brunswick and across Canada of communities doing exactly that. I uh, can't get into all those examples today, but you could certainly find them on our website. As a resource for municipalities, we hope that this primer will um, be used and as municipalities embark on this, say for the first time, or if they've already taken a look at uh, opportunities, this will be a way of bringing it together in a common type of plan or framework uh, for consideration by the community and by council. As I mentioned, it outlines the value and benefits of developing a community energy plan. I'll share those with you in a minute. It also shares how to get started in preparing a report to council. And one of the Im most important things is to ensure that you have the buy-in and support by elected officials, uh, various staff and other community stakeholders, and that you create a process that is sustainable over the long term. Um, and it's important to engage those uh, proponents uh, early in the process. Uh, we also give some tips. There's a, actually an entire appendix dedicated to how do you engage local stakeholders, and there's various methods to do that. Uh, we have, of course, eight steps uh, to develop and implement a plan in some detail. And we also provide some ideas of actions and approaches to realizing a community energy plan in New Brunswick. We've drawn on many case examples, so as you read through the primer, you will find case examples that support the various things that are introduced. Uh, it's a great way to kind of learn about uh, the points being made and, and what other communities are doing. Um, and I'll be able to show you a screenshot a little bit later. Forgive me for the text on the slide, uh, but briefly, essentially, this, this is a tool to help municipalities and communities prioritize decisions around energy with a view to improving efficiency, uh, reducing emissions, maybe driving some economic development. Uh, using this primer's guidance, uh, municipalities can develop a CP identifying ways to integrate energy into other local government strategies, land use planning, policies, and municipal projects and new development. So key in this is that we're not simply talking about where are you going to place you know a solar uh, photovoltaic inv installation but how are you going to integrate energy thinking that energy lens into other municipal planning processes which is so important and so uh, this guide really does explain uh, many of the opportunities to do that in fact it gives a lot of examples around municipal policy instruments that can be used uh, in the planning process and of course, we also provide some energy literacy resources. So if you want to dig a little deeper into uh, uh, energy information, uh, we certainly provide some links to be able to do that. It's important to try to embed uh, energy planning into all municipal processes. And there's several ways to do that. Again, this is explained in the primer. In the research done by Quest, uh, we've noted that some of the key benefits of community energy plans, and there's about 180 that we've been able to identify across Canada, that these ones percolate to the top as being some of the most important drivers or benefits of community energy planning. And I think starting with economic development, uh, energy independence and security in terms of uh, reliability and resiliency at the local level, both to uh, shocks in uh, energy, global energy prices, but also to extreme weather events. Uh, other key benefits include healthy communities or healthier communities, efficient communities, and other environmental benefits. And in many cases, we've seen that where a community has developed a plan, uh, it's, more, uh, it's more promising for them uh, to, in fact, obtain future funding for the delivery or implementation of actual projects. And so that uh, that's an important point to note as well. Funders often look at communities with a plan as having done their homework uh, to identify and prioritize the various options that might be in front of them uh, for investment. So in a very simple form, this is what a community energy plan process looks like. You start, of course, with an assessment of your current energy usage and potentially your emissions uh, associated with that energy usage. And that can uh, take many shapes and forms, and I won't deal with that right today. 
But once you've got an assessment, you can start to develop um, a plan with some actions that address those sources of uh, energy usage or en uh, emissions. And you develop a plan that may include uh, actions uh, that may be specific, like say, say projects, or how do you introduce energy into the municipal planning process. That's the snapshot version. In the actual guide, we have eight steps that we outline in quite a bit of detail. Uh, and they're chronological, so if you're starting from the beginning, this is the type of process you would want to follow to be able to develop a thorough community energy plan and to implement the plan. So it's not simply enough to develop a plan, but you need an implementation strategy to go along with the plan. And um, as I mentioned earlier, it's very important to engage the necessary stakeholders early in the, in the process. And that may include forming an advisory committee of some sort that can provide guidance and oversight uh, through the development stage and through uh, the implementation and report back to council. As I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, many of the communities also undertake an assessment of their energy usage and emissions, and they sometimes do this in a tab table format, um, uh, which is fine and also consistent with the requirements federally. Uh, it's a voluntary program called Partners for Climate Protection of the FCM, uh, where they've collected that. But uh, others have gone uh, even further to map their energy and emissions, and I think that's a very useful visual tool and aid when you're doing assessment uh, about uh, where the opportunities might be. And then you want to develop a vision, and that vision needs to understand what is the local context, uh, what are the key drivers or barriers in the community, how you're going to shape this so that you get community buy-in, and engage your community stakeholders in the development of that vision. You can have a, um, a visionary type style target, which is top down, you set a target and you try to meet that target, or you can have a pragmatic target that is defined based on the opportunities you've identified. So there's different ways to approach the vision and the targets you might set. You want to quantify, of course, that vision and define a time horizon for reaching those. You might have some short-term actions and some long-term actions, and it's important to have both. You need some uh, that are short-term in order to um, uh, show some early wins, build some success. Uh, potentially, these are early wins that can be built upon over time, so maybe a district heat system uh, may have several phases to its expansion, for example. And some longer-term actions, uh, which you, you may not see the direct results from over the three years, but potentially five or 10 year time horizon. And of course, this is also dependent on the costs associated with the actions. So you're looking for actions in the short and long term and prioritizing those based on potentially the return on investment uh, or rate of return for, uh, for each of these individual actions. Uh, and sometimes there's advancements in technology or there's uh, changes in policy or the economy that can favor certain actions at different times. So you have to be aware of those changes as you go forward as a municipality. Once you've prioritized actions, you want to present the plan to council. Uh, you want council adoption for a plan, and you want to go about implementing that plan, and necessarily you need a, a strategy to do that. Uh, monitor and report on your progress is sort of the final step here, um, and you want to try to renew that plan maybe every uh, five years, uh, give or take, uh, so that it's maintained current, you've identified new opportunities, you've taken into consideration the changing context in which you're operating. Some examples of actions that are typically included in community energy plans. This is on the actual planning side, so these are not, not necessarily project specific, but uh, in the purview of municipal powers of, of uh, planning, uh, these are some of the things that they can do. So in their actual official um, municipal plan or official community plan, they can incorporate energy lens um, as, as one of the criteria uh, for their official plan. Uh, more specifically, in the zoning bylaws, they can uh, they can require that developments, new developments, or even um, the the uh, retrofit of existing buildings and so forth, uh, adopt uh, certain minimum standards for efficiency or integration of local renewable resources, if that's applicable, uh, and so forth. So, zoning bylaws can be an important tool of a municipality. Plan of subdivisions and site plan control and development permit systems all affect. Uh, the the nature of developments uh, in terms of how they are designed, uh, for example, solar orientation, uh, as well as the density and height control. Uh, some communities go as far as developing a separate community improvement plan, 
uh, or even charging local improvement charges for uh, improvements in a particular neighborhood. And these are interesting tools um, that should be considered when a municipality embarks on a community energy plan, because these are all ways in which it can affect energy usage over the long term. The actual uh, um, uh, municipal powers are described in the Community Planning Act and Municipalities Act in New Brunswick. And if you're also interested, uh, you might want to refer to the Electricity Act uh, and another act, regular uh, other energy regulations in the province of New Brunswick to get more familiarized with those regulations. Well, this is at a high level. Uh, some of the specific actions that we found in community energy plans across Canada, these are just a few. And there's, a, there's about an average of uh, 35 actions identified in plans. Sometimes there's less or more, but these are the ones that trickle to the top. Um, public and stakeholder outreach and engagement seems to be crucial. Is that notion that you need to get the community engaged uh, and, and may, many times informed uh, as well as engaged and as well as to get their buy-in for specific projects or decisions a council might make. Energy efficiency is one of those things we, we always advocate for before you consider doing other things because uh, you want to use energy most efficiently before you start tying in renewables, for example. It's also the um, cheapest way to achieve cost uh, reductions, energy cost reductions. Um, planning and policy measures we just touched on. Other transportation measures are often included. These could include fleet-related measures, so municipal fleet, uh, transportation and transit, as well as anti-idling measures active transportation, renewable energy and district energy or CHP uh, often figures uh, into community energy plans. Uh, of course, not, the, not every community is going to be the same. Every community has a different set potentially of resources at their disposal. And when we think about renewable energy, we should think about it in terms of electricity as well as heat production, so thermal. And they are distinct, but you can have them combined or separate. And if you're going to produce electricity, then the electricity should be tieable or grid tied, uh, in, unless it's for a remote application. But where necessary, you need to tie it to the grid. There are additional costs to doing that. So consider the the, the placement of uh, renewable energy sites as one of the determining factors of its viability. And for district energy or district heat, uh, you want to make sure that your heat sources whether it's a waste heat capture or heat from biogas or biomass or a combination of, uh, of uh, sources, that you've got um, a anchor load, essentially a demand for that heat in, in a vicinity that's close enough, um, in an area that's close enough to the source to make that viable. Public transit measures, where that makes sense. Of course, in New Brunswick, we have uh, transit uh, systems in a couple of our cities, but many of our communities are smaller. Uh, communities with no transit. So uh, you might want to think about it in ten, instead of transit as how do you improve mobility and accessibility and look at your population context. And there are different ways to look at this. Um, so rather than the typical uh, large bus uh, network, uh, you might be looking at other mobility options. Solid waste diversion and landfill gas and low carbon vehicles are two others. I should also add potentially that water uh, treatment uh, and pumping is another energy cost to a municipality. It's a, a significant one and often figures into community energy plans. And I'll just pause for a moment. If uh, folks have questions and comments, you can uh, please share those with me uh, using the dashboard. I will open the lines up at the end uh, so that we can have a Q&A and some discussion. The primer also describes some financing mechanisms that you might consider as a municipality. These include uh, some notable provincial and fund federal funding sources. Uh, they are listed in the primer. I haven't provided the details here on the slide. And also alternative financing mechanisms. These are, from our research, what some of the municipalities have done in order to fund uh, projects. And some municipalities, through their savings, uh, of course, they're looking at that as potentially reducing the overall costs uh, of a municipality, but they may be also looking at creating a green fund, I'll call it a green fund, where they're parking some of the savings in order to pay for other improvements or energy projects or even uh, other uh, municipal services and, and other social benefits in the community. So it really depends on how you want to direct that, but it's a, it's a way of taking those savings and reinvesting them in the community. Um, so it's, it's very interesting. 
So for next steps, uh, one of course is to consult the primer, which we will make uh, available online later today uh, through the Quest website, and we'll be sending that out through the Quest New Brunswick Caucus and the um, municipal associations in New Brunswick um, to uh, as many municipalities as we can get uh, the primer to. Once you've had a look at the primer and uh, you've determined where you are at in relation to those steps and where you'd like to go, uh, we would um, we would recommend that you request a motion by council to approve the development of a community energy um, plan. As I mentioned earlier, in the beginning of the primer, there's a section on how do you prepare an introductory report to council. So if you're new at this, if the community has not yet considered a community energy plan, you want to make a report to council to get their buy-in for the process to proceed. So it's a very important uh, first step. Uh, you, you might want to request uh, council to approve the development of a baseline energy or emissions inventory as a way to prepare your analysis, uh, develop targets, identify opportunities for projects or policies that uh, can uh, move you in that direction. You want to engage uh, certainly your staff, uh, and often enough it's important to have uh, at least one council member on board, uh, often a CAO, often the uh, if you have an energy manager, if not probably the facilities manager, uh, public works head, uh, some other department heads, and, and you should possibly engage other staff but also community stakeholders uh, as part of the process of developing a vision, developing targets, uh, even developing the, the entire plan before you present it to council for adoption. So the final the final thing here is uh, you you identify the actions in a plan uh, and uh, you develop an implementation strategy around that with some time timeline to that and you present the plan to council for adoption. Once it's adopted then you can move forward with its implementation. So that's in a nutshell the community energy planning primer for you. I'm just going to quickly draw your attention to uh, our website and the primer itself. So the, first of all, the website. If you haven't already taken a look, it's questcanada.org. If you want to find the Quest New Brunswick section, you simply go to our network, and on the left-hand column, you'll find caucuses. You simply go to the New Brunswick caucus, and here you will find a description of the Quest New Brunswick caucus, uh, as well as relevant projects, publications, webinars like this one, and so forth. Uh, so we expect that the publication will probably be listed here. It may be listed under the resource hub as well. Uh, so look for that a little later today or tomorrow. Uh, you should be able to find that new publication online. As well as you can find out more information about us, uh, about smart energy communities and, and other publications that uh, have come out of Quest. The second thing I want to draw your attention to is the, in, the actual primer. So here we're showing the uh, a screenshot. This is actually the PDF version of the community energy planning that will be published later today. And I'll just flip through briefly. Uh, as I mentioned, I've gone through some of these sections in my presentation of what the community energy planning includes, uh, primer includes, followed by an executive summary, very high level, uh, very easy to understand. And the, important, the, the point here was that we, we don't want this to be something that will be read once and, and you know put on a shelf somewhere. We want this something, uh, this is something that can be used uh, throughout the process of developing and implementing a community energy plan. And we wanted to ensure that, uh, for example, a council might understand what, what is important uh, or a CAO or a an, an energy planner might understand the importance of a primer in uh, less than a page or two. And we get into the actual primer. Uh, what is a community energy plan? What are the benefits? I listed those earlier, but of course we go into some more detail about the benefits. We talk about the steps before you start. This is about by, uh, building uh, stakeholder support, engaging staff, political champions, and so forth. Uh, ensuring the necessary resources are allocated to the process, institutionalizing or embedding a community energy plan, and preparing the plan. This is about reporting, preparing a report to council, the rationale around developing a community energy plan, including examples of, of how you might describe this uh, so that you get the, get the council buy-in. Um, along with context, opportunities that you might want to consider and the scope uh, of, of a potential community energy plan. So these are things to consider when you're presenting for the first time to council uh, this thought of developing a community energy plan. 
We've outlined the steps in a, in a table here as well with a with an approximate time frame for the actual uh, steps that are here. And then we get into the steps themselves. So we've provided quite a bit of dis, uh, description of each of the steps um, along with key tips or advice from the experts in these uh, boxes here. So as you go through each of these steps, you also have links to relevant um, references or publications. You have links to the, the types of things you would want to consider. And you have experts from key tips. So you can see how others might have gone about uh, undertaking each of these steps. I'll just quickly go through. I won't uh, spend much time, but these are the steps I outlined earlier all eight steps. Sometimes communities ask, what will it cost? It really depends from community to community and the scope of what you're considering. And this is to give you an example of uh, the cost uh, of developing and implementing a CEP for a variety of community sizes. So if you're under 10,000 or less, it's probably the cost of doing it, just do it approach. Uh, if you're a city of 100,000 or more, you might want to spend a bit of money to either have the necessary expertise on staff or hire consultants or undertake an assessment, uh, which which does take uh, some effort. So depending on the size of your municipality, you can probably, if you're a smaller community, do it yourselves with uh, data that you have available um, within your own you know, staff or within local stakeholder groups, larger cities may have to spend a little bit more to accomplish. I mentioned financing mechanisms are linked here and described. Uh, and, and I should just take one moment to mention that we expect and we hope that the, over the course of the next year or two, other financing mechanisms uh, will uh, become available through whether it's uh, climate change or infrastructure funding or green municipal fund. And so keep your eye out for uh, you know your ears open for potential new opportunities uh, for financing mechanisms whether it's for development of the plan or the implementation of the projects identified in the plan and finally applying an energy lens to the planning process in here we've described as I mentioned earlier a list of the municipal planning tools um, we've described them here we've also provided examples of other cities that have done this so for each of these uh, planning tools um, we've provided some examples of how they can be used to uh, impact energy usage over the long term. As you can see, there's quite a bit there, and of course our conclusion at the end. Energy uh, literacy uh, resources are also listed uh, in the appendix. Uh, examples of community energy plans are also listed here, so if you want to take a look at uh, an actual community energy plan from another community, you can do so. We've got plenty more. Uh, available on the website. We just picked a few that were, uh, you know, from various communities of relative size. Community engagement methods, as I mentioned earlier, there were quite a number of, uh, there's quite a number of methods to engage community stakeholders, and we've outlined them here. And for the benefit of the, the, the recipients and the, uh, the intended audience of this primer, we've listed the steps very very straightforward on the final appendix. So if you want a tear out sheet, don't don't necessarily tear it out, photocopy it. Um, you can present this one uh, page as the steps that you would maybe uh, undertake to develop a community energy plan. So that's the primer in a nutshell. And thanks uh, for taking the time to participate today. I'm now going to see if there are any questions in the dashboard. I don't see anybody. Uh, having raised any questions or hands, but perhaps I'll unmute the lines. So if you've had a chance to think about a question or a comment, please feel free to share that now. So perhaps I've, yes, is there a question? Is there no questions, then I must have covered all the bases. Yeah, um, Eddie. Yes. Uh, this is Rob Robichaud calling uh, from Energy Power here. Yes. Uh, I don't have a question, but I just have a comment. Uh, you did specify that it will be on the website later on today. Yes. 
the final writing? Yes, it will be in English and in French. Excellent. Okay, I'm looking really forward to, uh, to get my hands on that. Absolutely. I can make sure that uh, I notify you uh, as soon as that's up. It's Rob Robbery Show? Yes, that's right. That's excellent. Of course, I have to thank NB Power for their support for our project this year, which included uh, this primer. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Amy. Absolutely. Um, I, I might also mention that uh, in this process, while we were developing this, it became clear that um, there was a need for further information on the regulatory context, and that gets very, very detailed. And so what we decided was this primer was going to be intended for the, the audience we have, municipalities, without getting into that deep level of de technical detail, notwithstanding that information is important. So we, nope. ex we expect yeah, some, uh, we expect some more um, uh, documents to be developed over the course of this year that deal specifically with the planning uh, context, uh, regulatory context, where we're, whether we're talking about community planning or electricity or gas and so forth. Uh, but for the moment, for those who are, are online, uh, if you wish to participate in the energy planning process in New Brunswick, visit the NB Energy and Utilities Board website. Uh, there you can find more information. You can certainly become an intervener, uh, intervener status uh, to uh, contribute in that process and, and share your thoughts on uh, planning, energy planning in New Brunswick as it may pertain to the municipality. Um, but we we look forward to producing further documentation this year. So I want to thank you all for joining me today. And uh, if uh, there are no further questions, I believe we can bring the webinar to a close. Great. Thanks for, very much for all for joining today. Um, I also like to invite you to take a look at the website where you can find recordings of our previous webinars. Simply go to questcanada.org slash nbwebinar series and there you will find the recordings to our previous webinars and links to any upcoming webinars. Thanks very much everybody. Bye for now.